Welcome back, everyone. It's David. Week 12 of the NFL was eventful, to say the least. Coronavirus has loomed over the games all year, but this week was when it really took hold and showed no mercy. It left the Broncos without a quarterback, and the Steelers-Ravens game that was supposed to kick off on Thanksgiving still has yet to be played. And the NFL forced one team to play instead of the other because reasons. So we'll talk about all that, as well as the games that actually went off without a hitch. And remember, if you like what you see here, be sure to subscribe and follow Lingo Sports on Instagram. Starting with number five, call me crazy, but I want to see more games with no quarterbacks going forward. I obviously don't wish for anyone to contract COVID, but before all the Broncos quarterbacks had to go on the COVID list, their game against the Saints barely moved the needle. But once they were forced to call up a wide receiver from the practice squad to play under center, it became must-see TV. How were the Broncos going to fare? Could they really pull off the upset against a team whose quarterback was making his second career start? As it turns out, no they couldn't. The game went exactly as expected, with the Saints cruising to victory. Kendall Hinton was put in the most unenviable of spots, so you really can't criticize his performance. That said, he ended up throwing more interceptions than completions. That is fucking shocking. Although speaking of, I'm sure Cowboys fans are loving the fact that Jerry Jones called one of his own as bad as Hinton. That's got to be going over real well in the locker room. (laughs) What a clown show. But what made this game great was that it whizzed by. Between Taysom Hill being who he is and the Broncos having no real quarterbacks, almost every play in this game was a running play. Them and few stoppages and a game that was over in less than three hours. That's monumental in an age where attention spans are shorter than ever before. Plus, it pretty much rendered red zone moot since it wrapped up in time for everyone to catch the endings to the Rams and Chiefs games. I'm not saying we need to defund the QBs. I enjoy watching Pat Mahomes do the magic hand thing every week just as much as the next guy. But take a team like the Jets, who are so obviously not trying to win. Everyone would be better served if they just stuck some random guy under center and have the game go by at a lightning pace just to put their fans out of their misery. COVID not only gave us a revolutionary way to speed up games, In college football, it also opened the door for a woman to kick in a Power 5 game for the first time in history. So I can't believe I'm saying this, but for the first time all year, thank you, COVID. Number 4. Beating the Chiefs in Arrowhead was the Raiders' Super Bowl. It's been all downhill since then. Their record since that game isn't terrible. They're 3-3, but those three losses have been embarrassing. Their first game after beating the Chiefs was a thorough 45-20 pasting at the hands of the Buccaneers. Then in the Chiefs rematch, they tempted the football gods by giving Mahomes the ball back with a full minute 43 remaining. And then there was whatever the hell that was against the Falcons. Yeah, I get it. It's hard for a West Coast team to play what is essentially a 10 a.m. kickoff for them, but it's not like they've never played on the East Coast before. And they got to do it again next week against the Jets. Could you imagine if they showed up like this against the Jets? That's to say nothing about the team they were actually facing. This is a Falcons team that coughs up leads for fun. How do you make them look like the 85 Bears all of a sudden? Derek Carr has struggled with consistency in the past, but he's never turned the ball over more than three times in a game. This week, he managed to top even that. Now, even though Carr is putting together a solid throwing season, 19 touchdowns to three interceptions heading into this game, he has trouble hanging on to the ball when he gets sacked. And boy did that issue rear its ugly head in this one. Two sacks, two lost fumbles in the first half. Yes, it's true his offensive line did him no favors, but you've got to do a better job of hanging on to the ball. And perhaps those two lost fumbles were what led Carr to throw this pick six, which effectively ended the game. Deion Jones is a baller, and his awareness on this play was second to none. And while the Raiders were in desperation mode, it would have been better to take the sack than to throw it in that scenario. This sums it up. Just when it looked like Josh Jacobs was about to break off a huge run, he fumbles it instead. One step forward, ten steps backwards. If you're a Raiders fan, you don't need to be reminded of it again. But last year, this team was an identical 6-4, and four, then went out east to play the Jets and got blown out. They proceeded to go 1-5 and five the rest of the way and missed the playoffs. If the Raiders somehow go 1-5 and five or worse with the Jets, Chargers, and Broncos left on their schedule, something drastic needs to happen this offseason. Number three, speaking of the Chargers, Justin Herbert has been a revelation since coming in as the starter. But there's one thing that will hold him back from potentially winning Offensive Rookie of the Year, and possibly even beyond that, and that's Anthony Lynn. 
Remember all those jokes everyone used to make about Andy Reid's clock management? Those should now be reserved exclusively for Anthony Lynn. Not to mention how impressive it is to lose so many one-possession games. But the ineptitude on display against the Bills was beyond reason. Take this from the first half. It's 4th and 2 and the Chargers call a timeout. Surely they're going to drop a play to try and get a first down convert. Oh. He seriously called a timeout just to punt the ball. Then in the 4th, he inexplicably calls another timeout because he was arguing the spot of the ball. Timeouts are a precious commodity in close games, yet here Lynn is tossing them out like dollar bills at a strip club. So now we get to the two-minute drill. They have no timeouts left, of course. But Justin Herbert, with an absolute dime of a pass to get it down to the goal line, and force Bills fans to relive their PTSD from the Hale Murray. So, are they going to hurry to spike it? No? Just going to take their precious time to get to the line of scrimmage? Alright then. Bold strategy. After this obviously botched run play, they just let 10 seconds run off before tossing this incompletion. Look, it was obvious they weren't going to win the game, but at least pretend to give a shit. Or try to get something out of that amazing play by Herbert. Anthony Lynn managed to waste yet another 300-yard passing game from Herbert, as well as an all-world performance from Joey Bosa. If he can't figure it out on a roster with this much talent, it's clearly time for him to go. Number 2. So does this mean that Kirk Cousins is good again? It was legitimately impressive how much adversity Cousins overcame in their comeback win against the Panthers. It was another one of his performances that justified a, You like that? You like that? You like that? He had to deal without Adam Thielen, who has been scoring touchdowns at a record pace this season. Then, midway through the game, he lost Alvin Cook, which placed the outcome of the game squarely on his shoulders. And as he was leading the comeback down 11, this noob Chad Beebe, who sounds like he belongs back in preschool, nearly threw it all away with this muffed punt. So when the game was on the line and Cousins threw the winning touchdown pass, we all knew it couldn't have gone to anyone other than Chad Beebe. Unreal. I can't imagine how frustrating it must be to have to root for Kirk Cousins. He's clearly one of the more talented quarterbacks in the league, but it can be so hard for him to put it together. And when he does, it makes you wonder why he can't do it every week. But then again, he likely wouldn't be such a lightning rod among fans if he wasn't making $30 million a year. Because while he's far from one of the league's best clutch QBs, he has shown a propensity to come up big in late game situations. He led a similar comeback to this last year against the Broncos, and there was that enormous OT winning drive against the Saints in the playoffs. Losing to the Cowboys seemingly took all the wind out of the Viking sails, but a win like this can help steady the ship and get them back on course especially once Cousins gets all his weapons back. If the Vikings manage to squeak into the playoffs this year, it won't be because of Dalvin Cook. It won't be because of Adam Thielen or Justin Jefferson, or even Chad Beebe. It'll be because of Kirk Cousins. And finally, number one, Derrick Henry has entered the MVP chat. I still think Mahomes is going to win it this year, and comfortably at that. But Henry is making us consider a non-QB for the award, and that's significant. It certainly doesn't help the perception that MVP is just awarded to the best quarterback every year when Adrian Peterson was the last non-QB to win it. Back in 2012. And it took historic numbers for him to do that. We've seen the singular impact that Henry has on this offense, most notably during the Titans' AFC Championship run. And we're seeing it again this season. Like when he tossed a 190-pound Josh Norman aside like it was nothing. Or when he tortured the Ravens again. This week, he torched the Colts to the tune of three touchdowns in a key divisional game. His performance was aided by the fact that he didn't have to face DeForest Buckner, but it would be foolish to leave it at just that. Look at how many people converge on him to try and tackle him, yet he still picks up the first down. Stack box? No problem. It really is amazing how agile he is despite his frame. Here, Henry displays his quickness, simply gashing right past the defender, then outrunning a bunch of them while crossing midfield. And this third touchdown run, by far the most impressive of the night. The way he jukes out a large group of defenders on the way to the end zone. Look at how perplexed number 32 is by what just happened. When Henry won the Heisman, he broke a streak of five straight quarterbacks to win the award prior to him. Why can't he do the same in the NFL? Even if he never wins an MVP in his career, no one should discount how valuable he is to his team and the league.